Hi, Senator Pizzo, welcome. Hi, sorry I'm late, I apologize. That, that's all right, we're all here. We were just getting ready to get started, so you're right on time. So, hi everybody, welcome. We're so excited to have you here for the condo safety seminar of the year. Before I get started and introduce these rock star presenters, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we Stone Building Solutions got here. I've spent the last 20 years in insurance claims for condominiums. In 2014, we started as a elite boutique firm helping condominiums solve hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance claims and it evolved over the past decade to helping associations with all their insurance compliance. So we're a full service engineering. We do bid preparation, construction monitoring, structural integrity reserve studies, regular reserve studies, your insurance valuation appraisals, and of course, how we got started property damage claims. Uh, we feel it's our duty and our obligation to help our customers through this challenging and very, very needed changing in times. Um, we got so many accolades that we're very proud of the past three years running. We're Diamond Award, Florida Community Association Journal, um, Reader's Choice Award. We're also 2023 Enterprising Women of the Year and 2022 Chase Bank Women to Watch all because our unique approach for associations. I have the honor and privilege today of introducing two of the best senators that we have working for us, um, working very hard, I have to say, it's such an honor. Um, from the North, we have our Republican, beautiful Senator Jennifer Bradley. And then from the South, our Democratic outspoken Senator Jason Pizzo. And we're normally at this time of year, we're starting to hear debates. It's very unusual that a topic like this, we've been able to come together in a bipartisan stance to really move these cha need to change forward. So without further ado, we'll start with ladies first. Um, Senator Bradley, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. She is the author of Senate Bill 4D and 154. Well, thanks, Tara, and thanks for having me here today. Um, so, yeah, I represent uh, seven counties in rural North Florida. Uh, so it seems a little odd that I would be running condo legislation, but I chaired community affairs uh, when Surfside collapsed. And the jurisdiction of that committee includes building regulations and building codes. Uh, and so I went to work bill, uh, drafting the bill for the milestone inspection, which then grew into a much larger comprehensive condo package uh, that was passed in 4D. And then we updated that with 154, uh, and we're coming back this year for some more, uh, some more needed reforms. Uh, Senator Pizzo has uh, obviously at the time of Surfside represented Surfside, and uh, we've worked very closely, been an invaluable resource um, on, on all issues condo, and uh, look forward to going back this year and, uh, and, and addressing some other issues in condos that has needed to be done for a long time. Senator Pizzo. So, <clears throat> Tara, I think you you won Chase Bank Women to Watch because you're six feet tall and it's impossible not to see you. <laughs> hard to miss me. But hard to miss you. Um, and uh, you can call me outspoken. I, I like to say that I'm just very candid and very straightforward. Uh, I represent now 20 cities uh, in mostly coastal Broward as well as Northeast Miami-Dade. So I have Sunny Isles Beach and Aventura, which are condo-laden, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Hallandale, and Hollywood, which uh, also... Pompano Beach, uh, all, all the way up the entire coast, all the way up to, to Palm Beach County. Uh, and Senator Bradley is incredibly modest uh, in the undertaking that she has uh, performed. Uh, politicians, I, I think uh, those that I work with general, have a general sense of, of public service and wanting to give back and, 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 and serving their constituents. And so she's very nice the way she says it, but she really has no condos in her district. So this is the functional equivalent of me spending a few thousand hours over the last couple of years on like farming equipment, right? In an area that's completely, you know, high rise condos and, and a built environment. So uh, she's incredibly gracious with both her time and, and with her modesty about uh, how much time she spends on this. But as a kid, uh, my grandfather read the right stuff. So we spent summers up until I was about 12 going to Cocoa Beach, Florida. We still have a condo there. Uh, and it's different than Miami. And I know that uh, a lot of the people that are watching, the viewers here today, 
um, understand and appreciate the Miami issues and Miami stuff. But this is really this has become a statewide issue. I think we're over a million and a half condos and um, and some of the things that Senator Bradley has has proposed uh, were, were at my urging that may seem like tough love measures. And so, you know, this is important and critically important to have these kinds of forums. And we, we welcome the invitation to have tough love discussions about about real life issues. Well, that's what we'd like to hear. And I just believe I got the chat working. So let's see if that works. People want to want to be ask you guys questions. We're so excited to have you on here. Sure. So when we get started, we'd like to really talk about kind of why we're here, how we got here, and how we can move forward. We put together a little presentation, which I'm going to share with the group. Hmm. Was it something I said? Never. Okay. Well, sometimes it is actually. Well, why I'm pulling that up, um, I heard from a very wise man a long time ago, actually one of the leaders at Marsh Insurance. And he told me, he said, Tara, three things will rule the world. And I said, really, three things? And he said, yes, insurance, banking, and politics. And I said, wait a second, what about what about real estate? And he said, how are you going to get real estate without loans from the banks? And what kind of banks are going to give you loans without insurance? And then I started driving down the highway and looking over at all the big buildings. And I said, whoa, look at it. It's banks and insurance companies. You go into an arena and it's banks and insurance companies. And those three pillars really came together at the same time is a lot of the why that we got here. Um, talking about what you guys saw on those fronts of insurance, banking, and politics. Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about what you saw happening on the um, banking side after the collapse of Surfside? Yeah, and and so, I mean, when 98 people die in the state of Florida, uh, Tallahassee is going to take notice. Um, and we're going to do we're going to make sure that that Florida has the procedures in place and that our buildings are safe. We have a lot of aging condos. Um, we have a building code for when the buildings are built, but there's no procedure. There's no no requirements in the state of Florida that these really old buildings that that are that our families live in uh, throughout the state, that they're ever inspected to make sure that they're structurally sound. Uh, so the legislature took note of that. Um, banking and uh, insurance also took note of that. And uh, insurers started changing their underwriting requirements. Banks started asking for, let me, let me look under the hood a little bit more. Let me get copies of inspections, uh, engineer reports. Where are your reserves? So the, the private market stepped in every much, every much uh, as, as much as Tallahassee did. Um, and so 154, the, the requirements and the, the updates to condos is certainly a legislative creation. But even without that, the world of condos was not going back to a pre-surfside world. There were going to be new requirements. There was going to be more inspections. There was going to be more financial health required of condos. Um, and so, yeah, I think you saw all three of those um, those areas sort of converge after Surfside. And what the legislature did is cr create a framework so that that can work really seamlessly, so that we have a process, so we have standard inspection reports, that we have standard reserve requirements. Uh, and that will be a basis for banking and for insurance to be able to, uh, to do what they were going to do anyway. So it's always the question, the changes here, we're saying it's happening independently of the legislature, it's happening independently of insurance and banking, all those three things are coming together at the same time. But how are we going to regulate? Everyone says, well, what happens if I don't do it? And the bottom line is those three entities are going to be that caused it to happen in the first place is how it will be regulated. The 
where are the condo police, right? I always say the condo police aren't coming in the middle of the night to come get you. How is this going to affect you? It's going to hit your pockets. We have um, Phil Massey. He's local here in Central Florida. Him and his partner, Nagar Sharifi, I believe they insure over a thousand condominium associations. I reached out to them to kind of get some perspective on what they're seeing on the insurance side. And they're saying that they're coming on for new policies and they're asking for copies of these reports, not just the milestones, but now asking for the SERS and the structural integrity reserve studies, and they're unable to be able to grant coverage. There's still a little bit of window because they can tell people, hey, it's been to 2024, but it's going to affect whether you even can buy insurance or not. I know we don't want insurance because it's too expensive, but also if you have to go to a phase one or a phase two, their biggest advice from the insurance side is to get ahead of that so they can communicate to the insurance company that, hey, look, we know this association has some issues. They're in part of the phase two, but this is their plan. Insurance companies don't like to hear, like they don't know what's going on. They don't have a plan. It's in total chaos. Just think if you are insuring a risk and saying this is a good risk or not a good risk, and now all of a sudden there might be some structural deficiencies that are causing a phase two, you certainly would want answers. So with your renewals coming up, getting ahead of this is very important. Did you guys see the news this week on the Fannie Mae blacklist being public? Yeah. And so basically Fannie Mae is saying we've had this list and we've kept it to ourselves the whole time, but now we're actually going to publish the non-financiable list. So if we won't lend to you, we're going to make it known. So ultimately, this is the new law. Jason or Jen, do you want to talk about these additions in Senate Bill 154 that kind of is the teeth here? Jen, sure. go ahead. Okay, sure. And so in 154, there was really two components. We had the milestone inspection piece for condos that were 30 years uh, older, older. Um, and we had the SERS component. And 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 condos have been using reserve studies for years, or, or they should have been if they're in good health. The ones that do a lot of uh, reserve studies had a lot less special assessments than, than other associations. Um, but 154, Senate Bill 154 created a, a, a unique reserve that needs to be done by condos now every 10 years. And it is a reserve study that will look at all the structural components of the condo uh, and make sure that the reserve amount uh, will satisfy each of those structural elements. And so, and the budget that they adopt in 25, uh, that's voted on in, in 2025, will have to reserve for all of those items. So you'll have the milestone inspection when you're, you know, when the condo is 30, and you also have a surge requirement to make sure that, that condos are fully funded um, and that they're able to replace these structural items uh, at the end of their useful life. Uh, that doesn't mean that the full value of the roof has to be fully funded in year one. It means that it's on a schedule and when the useful life of the roof is over, the money is there to be able to fix it so that the building continues to be well maintained and be safe. And, and, each, of the items on this, yeah, and each of the items on this slide will have to be provided uh, to prospective buyers. So there's a lot of transparency. When you go to purchase a uh, a condo, you are not going to be in the dark about, hey, has has this association been waiving reserves for years? What is the condition right. of the building? I mean, in years past, you had uh, you you had owners who didn't even realize the condition of the building. People, you know, waiving reserves, you know, based on a very low threshold of a quorum. Uh, people had no idea that they were waving away uh, reserves and that the condition of some of the buildings was was really quite poor. Uh, so so all of this is a lot of transparency to make sure that everybody, including buyers, uh, know exactly what they're walking into. And I know. And we this, sorry, go ahead. There's, there's a term uh, to describe association members and especially residents. And sometimes people take offense to it. And I remember the first time I think I told Senator Bradley, she kind of looked at me like, you know, thinking about the people that she's met and all the town halls that she's gone to all around the state. But it's condo associations are really what are called unsophisticated parties. And that's not a criticism. It's, you know, in, I live in a condo building. I'm the only senator that, in the, you know, in Florida that lives in a condo building. 
but you know, I have pediatric neurosurgeons. I have, uh, you know, the foremost accountants. I have, you know, the, the, the best of the best and the best in their fields and all that stuff. But unless you're literally in the association business, so to speak, this is not your forte. Senator Bradley is a, a brilliant attorney. I, I, I'm considered to be pretty good too. But, you know, if there's a criminal justice related question before she got into this sort of forum when she was in the, in the Senate, she would have called her friend Jason, right? If there's something related to, to transactional, I would call my friend Senator Bradley, a specialist in that field. And so it's not a criticism, but it needs to be understood that even as two lawyers here that you have flanking you, at least on my screen, when I get my condo docs, I have to, I read them twice, you know, I, I you know, to make sure that the things line up and I'm understanding when votes come up and, and, uh, and, and things like that. So it's not a criticism, but this huge gray area, this bubble, this sort of out of sight, out of mind over there crowd, condo owners were treated worse than prison inmates in Florida. What I mean by that is for a long time, the, the, the zeitgeist of Tallahassee was that condos were a second or third home, not your largest asset in your primary home. They were just so much over there and not an issue and they'll take care of themselves. And there's 150 of them. They can find the means and the, and the money to do it. And there really was not a lot of consideration because people realized they were getting the benefit of economies of scale and purchasing power living in a condo. So they should assume whatever burden they may one day have to figure out without thinking about this in a sort of long term sense. So I digress. But I just, you know, it, it, to understand why all of a sudden that it was like, go slow, hurry up in Tallahassee. Yes, tragically, 98 lives were lost in my district, but it was more eye opening about really, wow, this in, this physical plant and structure in so many thousands of places in Florida has been wildly ignored. Mm hmm. And you're kind of like letting, and I say unsophisticated because you're like letting, you know, the dictates of everything of sort of, this is the free state of Florida. Let them, they can run themselves. They can take care of themselves with this very broad macro kind of supervision of the Department of Business Trust and Regulation, which, you know, I don't know where that gets anybody, but go ahead. Yeah. And, and I'll piggyback off that. The, the, and, and currently this will be addressed, and I'm jumping ahead a little, but, but when we get into what next year's bill, what this coming session's bill uh, will address board members in the state in, in condos in the state of Florida, there's no education requirement. They literally, they just sign a document saying they've read the bylaws and the, and the, uh, they, and the declaration. And that's it. There is no requirement that they take a course as board members to understand what their fiduciary duty is, what the scope of their duty is, have a full understanding of what the rights of the owners uh, in the association, the importance of access to records, and all, none of that is required. And so we're going to come While back. While they're handling millions of dollars every year. Billions of, of Floridian dollars are in associations. And and there is no requirement for board members to have uh, to to have that education. And so in the bill, I know uh, I, the bill will be filed soon. But there was some uh, some requests. Well, maybe we should uh, exempt the att attorneys from having to do this because of their attorneys. And I said, no, no, no. Every attorney, everyone, because if you do probate, you do not know the scope and scale of your condo duties and responsibilities. Um, so everybody is going to have to do uh, board member education. You're going to have to do a legislative update every year. Uh, make sure that we know what updates or what bills we passed. That would have been very uh, that would have been very helpful uh, if that had been in place over the last several years to keep every board member in the state of Florida updated on um, some pretty uh, uh, transformative changes in the world of condo over the last few years. So um, that, but I'm jumping ahead, but but that education, uh, to Senator Pizzo's point, there there is not a, a true understanding outside of condos, and there really isn't a true understanding in, in, a, in a lot of condos inside the association. Absolutely, and I really wanna drive the point home, guys, that everyone watching, the change is here, it's happening. It's not going away. We're gonna talk as we move through the presentation about what's in for next year, but they can tell you right now that there's no change or extension or all of a sudden this is gonna go away. So how is it gonna be regulated? We hear all the time, it says, well, Sally can't afford it. She can't afford the increased reserves. What's gonna happen? Well. 
This is the real truth. The bottom line is Sally's going to have to move because if Sally can't afford to live there, then you as the board member need to be ready to give your unit to Sally because it's going to become to a point where you're going to get on that blacklist. You're not going to be able to get insurance. No one's going to be able to get a loan to buy your unit. So the entire building's going to be devalued to nothing. So that's where the hard decisions are. You're going to make, you have to follow the law. And if you don't follow the law, then all of a sudden everybody has nothing. So it's some people are going to have to leave or everyone's going to have to leave. And nobody wants to hear that, that the bottom line is that was the enemy, the old way of thinking. So let me get back to our slideshow here. And what we're trying to say here, it's not the law, it's not the banks, it's not the insurance company that's the enemy. The enemy is the old way of thinking. And Jason, why don't you talk, take this one? Well, I, I and I see you smile a little bit because recently you, I think you attended a town hall where it got to the point, and to be fair, Senator Bradley, again, so gracious with, with her time and her effort and, and, and doing all this, but I've taking her around to Orlando, down to Miami, seven, eight different times. I think I think we've done a, about a dozen but at this point. And it gets to the point where people continue to ask questions, questions and, and I don't know, I think, yeah, I think you were there. And I sort of, I asked everybody in the crowd, raise your hand if you live in a condo and everybody's hand went up. And then I said, keep your hand up if you expect your son or daughter or grandchild to live in your condo when you're gone. And everybody put their hand down. <laughs> Do you remember this? Everybody yeah. put their hand down. It was so, so said, powerful. All right. And it was there was a gasp, there was an audible gasp in the room at everyone with each other looking around going, wow. And a couple of things were, were very true. And what came out of my mouth was, let's be very clear, there is no state bailout coming. And I, I just wanted everyone to understand that. And then, and I, cause I know a lot of your questions, even the chat already are gonna be around about affordability and all that stuff. But the analogy you have to use is, you know, you, you did, care was not taken, adequate care was not taken along the way. Whether you want to use the analogy of you ate cheeseburgers, smoked a pack of cigarettes and drank alcohol every day and never exercised, now you're wondering why all of a sudden there's a drastic change. Or more to the point, why we allowed in, in, in a large sense, associations to become glorified sixth grade student government associations where everybody wanted to be like reelected. And so they artificially suppressed association fees. You did with a, without a little bit over the years, and your people are absolutely right. If they stop me in Publix or in a Little League baseball field, they're like, Senator, my association fee just went up 50% this year. And when I ask, what has it been for the last five, six, seven years? And they tell me, no, no, it's it, it was just static. It was great. Like it was a number that I locked in. And now with insurance and this, it's just it's becoming so. But nothing, nothing stayed static for the last five or six years. Bread, milk, gas, everything went up. And inflation, everything went up. And I'm not excusing or discounting the sticker shock of the percentage increase, but the old way of thinking was even if you treated your home and it was immaculate and you did everything you were supposed to do and you were timely with all of your bills and all that, those who had the general, very generalized fiduciary responsibility and obligation to oversee and be good stewards of the physical plant and structure of the building did not do a good job. Mm -hmm. Really, really did, did not do a good job. And again, I have to go back to my colleagues, the 39 other people that are in the Senate, they'll never put themselves in their constituent position where, frankly, we have to tell a single family homeowner how much they have to put in reserves or in a savings account, that they can't ever touch it or do anything with it, that they're not skilled enough to know and sophisticated enough to know how to take care of their home. No one's ever going to accept that. No law is ever going to be passed about that, except for very generalized building codes and code enforcement. So this is a very strange scenario to find ourselves and we finally did the balancing test with people dying because of it that we now need to realize that the state has to participate somewhat because we're talking collectively about a greater number of people which outweighs one's individual sort of you know idea and the old way of thinking is it just generally defaulted to defer 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 and when I ask people to raise their hands and say, who expects to leave this to the next generation, that legacy interest kind of idea, everybody's hand went down and it was a gasp because at some point, everybody's come from a place where a home was built and someone wanted to have it stay in their family. And it was a multi-generation kind of thing, and usually other parts of the country. 
But folks, here we are with 60% of the housing stock of condos 30 years or older. And you go back to that first collapse I mentioned in, in where I was in Cocoa Beach. It was Harbor K in 1981, March 27th, 1981, where construction workers died and many people were injured. And a report came out. It wasn't like NIST waiting five to seven years like you do today. A report came out pretty quickly. It was in September of that year that said condos are a 50 or 60 year phenomenon, meaning they're useful life without interference, structural reserve studies and actual you know physical improvement and contractors and GCs and engineers are not meant to be to you know to last for a thousand years and up until that point those built up to that point that that literally is the engineering reality today things are built with 21st century technology it's a lot different but we have to take an honest look and your point is not apocalyptic and unrealistic in the sense that things are going to get discounted and devalued if if steps aren't taken so I have folks in my district, my constituents in my district, who live side by side with another building, like, wow, they're getting $2,000 a square foot. Yes, for 21st century technology with 10 foot ceilings, with a real plan, with a real set of financials. And the emails I get every day from the building next to it are, we can't get access to records. These people don't know what they're doing. They're hiring their brothers and their cousins to do the contracting and not delivering. If they do, they get a free renovation of their, I mean, all kinds of wildly crazy things that are not taking care of the core the body, whatever analogy you want to use. And folks, it's okay if you want to be honest with ourselves and say, I only expect to be here for five years. I only expect you to be here for 10 years and, and hold this like a stock, like some speculative stock you bought going, I just hope I sell it on the way up or I don't sell it when it's too far down. But people have to understand that there's going to be market forces of insurance, which are doubling and tripling in some places, Fannie and Freddie, which, don't allow a condo building to take out more than a 5% deductible like you might with your home or your car or your boat. But the real reality is people should expect sharp discounts if they're going to continue to, to lead and le live in such a lean manner with these condominiums. Yeah. They've squeezed all the juice. How many times that's all I do is condo work. So I've been in so many board meetings and you always hear, I'll be dead by then. I don't care. But this is the thing, guys, all the juice has been squeezed out of the orange. There's nothing left to squeeze. And it's not just happening in Florida. I don't know if you saw earlier this week in New York, there was a partial collapse of a building, um, one person injured. And it's just, America's getting old, right? We can't have something and not do preventative maintenance and not spend the money and keep not spending the reserves. And then this is the shift. It's the yeah. the old way of thinking is the enemy. There, there needs to be a, a fundamental rebalancing. And that's what, what there needs to be a rebalancing from sort of the old uh, condos are not legacy, generational property, short term, people kick the can, they wave, wave, wave. Um, and what happens is you have a new owner is left holding the bag, gets hit with a big special assessment. You just hope you're not the one there when that special assessment comes down because there's a big crisis or a big uh, structural problem. Um, and, and I know that the transition to get to the other side of 154 and get the reserves where they need to be. But when we get to the other side, it will help property values. It will help all owners to know that everybody before them has paid their fair share to keep the building maintained, to do the deferred maintenance, to get all of the uh, money that they need to be in a position to replace things when they break, to make sure that they're safe. So the transition will be tough love. The transition will be difficult. And, and we really don't know the impact of that yet. We're starting to see some SIRS come back. We have, we're starting to collect some data, um, see what the differences are regionally, but we don't have a, a real clear impact on the exact scope of what it will, you know, what that financial impact is. Uh, but I suspect in a lot of the uh, associations that have been just sort of waving, 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 um, and not really, uh, you know, taking their financial health seriously, um, there'll be an impact. But once we get through this this transition, uh, it will be a stronger market, both for insurance, for loans, uh, and for property values uh, when everything is stabilized and the proper proper actions are incentivized. Funny you should bring that up. 
Senator Bradley, because we are doing a webinar series every single month. In January, we're going to be doing rolling out reserves, how to actually roll this out to your membership. And then in February, we are doing on condo dissolution so that if it's impossible, you understand what roadmap is in front of you as that option, if it is or isn't as well. Ultimately, the adversary is not the law. It's not the money. It's the old way of thinking. And we have to move into this new condo world. Guys, just remember everybody on this call, if you think about the last time you had to do a restoration project at your building, how difficult that was. I don't, Jason, you have you had to do your recertification there? Uh, not recertification. So the one building that uh, I have a condo in is a 2020 building. The other one is 2009. But I did, I did do a renovation of the unit, come to find all kinds of interesting stuff in the walls. Um, it is Miami. Um, but, it, it, yeah, sorry. And, and, but on a re recertification note, but I've sat side by side, you know, while they're being done. Um, and Very I hope to get into, yeah, go ahead. Painful. It's painful. And the whole thing is, if, if you had to do that or you had to raise reserves before, think about going through that process as it's been for the last few years. If you are on a board and you're watching this, how much fear that you've had that if you wanted to do the right thing and every year came up and you wanted to rate waive reserves, but you couldn't get the votes or you were afraid that your neighbors were going to like yell at you when you were walking your dog because you were wanting to do the right thing. What we're talking about here is now the framework and the structures there to go into this new world of condo living. And when we're in this new world of condo living and you go to do preventative maintenance, there's going to be money in the bank when you will actually be rewarded for doing the preventative maintenance because that preventative maintenance is hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars less. So just think about it. I always give the example when you go into your shower every day and you see that little piece of grout that's come out or you see that little bit of cock and then you're like, oh my gosh, I got to get to that. I got to get to that. And then every day you go in there and then you get out and you're rushing to your meetings and everything yeah, else. Shower pad fails. Yeah. <laughs> $5,000, easy. Yeah. 10000 nice tile. You might have 30000 50000 where it would have been $200 to get yeah. a handyman out there to recock the shower. So this is what this, that little example, what we're seeing on major, major buildings. So what this new law here is going to give the framework to actually get the, the shower regrouted, to make sure that there's the waterproofing, to not let the balconies fall off the building before you do the maintenance, not to have spalling everywhere. So when you guys, I know it's so hard to get through this time, but when you find vendors, we're not the only, there's a really a lot of good engineer and reserve companies out there. When you get vendors to partner with, to actually you know, get crafty, get us, but we got to get in there and work these structural integrity reserve studies. And then we can keep tweaking them in three years. We tweak them. You don't, you're required to do it every 10, but it doesn't say you have to wait 10. When, when you do a budget, that's 10 years old, right? But you can work them and work them and work them. And as you have money and as you can do more preventative maintenance, that extends the useful life because they were very deliberate the way the law reads it says the SERS is based on the replacement cost value or deferred maintenance expense and what are those words deferred maintenance expense they're a little bit confusing but it says what that means is if you spend the maintenance expense to reroute the shower then you don't have to put in for the shower pan so that's really working with companies that can help you work on those plans and keep keep saving, saving. It won't be so bad down the road. And once we're into this new world way and the people that have moved have moved and the tears have fallen and we figured out a way to budget it and some people have to dissolve or whatever has to happen, everything's going to be so much better. Managers, think about knowing that you need something on a building and not having to go through World War III to get the reserves or get the money to get it. If you need to hire a painter, you can call a painter and there's actually money in the budget to do. So that's really what we need to think of. And remember that new world way of thinking, that's the promised land that we're all going to. So let's talk about the upcoming year. How, what's, you guys know what's going on. You know, you're, you make all these 
you know, bills and they're all coming together. Give us some behind the scenes of what really happens and what it's like and how is the sausage made? Oh, oh. Go ahead, Senator Riley. <laughs> I know uh, I, I'm waiting to hear your response, but I'll start with with uh, next year for for condo. So we've we've had this discussion now for 40 minutes about the changing kind of rebalancing of what we're asking of associations in the state of Florida, from the milestone to the SIRS with the reserve studies. So this is a big it's a big deal for associations and for owners to sort of navigate this new system. So, so those those uh, 4D and Senate Bill 154 really was was placed on a on a system that everybody for a long time knew had challenges. Uh, it is DBPR has thousands of complaints from associations. We've had grand jury reports. We've had House Select Committee reports for associations that don't behave ethically, transparently, upfront, um, clearly with their owners. And so what we're going to do this year is make sure that the management of boards and that the management of associations is such that owners are able to navigate these new requirements that we have a, a, a for instance, we mentioned board education. Uh, that will be in the bill, making sure that our board members have education. Um, there's a lot of disputes in associations. DBPR does not have jurisdiction to handle a lot of them. We're going to expand DBPR's jurisdiction so they can intercede on behalf of owners uh, to the extent that they're able. They're woefully underfunded, understaffed, but they will have some more jurisdiction. Hopefully we can we can try and get them some more resources. Um, access to records, a big issue. That's a big DBPR issue that they hear about and exceedingly frustrating for uh, for owners who are trying to get records, whether it be records about the SERS, estimates, uh, engineering reports, all of that. There, there needs to be a free flow of information. And with technology the way it is, we really should not be seeing this so much. Uh, right now, websites have to post uh, associations with 150 units or more have to provide all of that information, all of the official records on the website. Unit owners, password, can go onto that website and see all of the minutes. They can see the sir. They can see everything. Uh, that needs to That's take a good place. idea. Do what? Such a good idea. We should expand Such... it to fewer numbers of condos. Who could years. think of that? What a great idea. Oh, I had. oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, uh, but we'll take that down to associations with 25 units, uh, not expensive more, to set yeah. it up um, and, and put all of that, the documents online and, and include some extra documents to be in the official records, like building permits. Um, a lot of associations have special assessments. They're not completed. People don't see repairs being done. They go to the board, what's happening, where it's the staff, you know, the status of repairs. Uh, building permits that are pulled need to be a part of the official records and accessible uh, by owners, receipts, invoices, things that go that correlate with expenses. Those need to be accessible uh, on the website, too. And hopefully, uh, if those are audited, like we will require by DBPR, those websites will be a really the one stop for a lot of your documents and cut down on a lot of issues. Um, right now, you have a lot of reserves and associations, and Florida law doesn't clearly allow you to invest them. Uh, that will be in the bill. That's uh, a good idea. That's, that's good another idea. great idea I had. <laughs> but the uh, but and we'll do them like pensions. I mean, we are not gonna we are not gonna allow risky investments. I mean, if we invest our state workers and our uh, you know uh, financial means and retirements of of our teachers conservative um, not aggressive yeah yeah it is it is going to be very very safe and protected and insured um that will be in the bill um you know senator pizza mentioned before about the conflicts of interest with property management companies giving contracts to brothers relatives uh companies they have a financial stake in uh, that needs to make sure that we have full transparency and a process in place to make sure that each of those, if that does happen, is on the up and up and disclosed and, and the board is aware of that. And then lastly, we'll have criminal penalties uh, for really some of the uh, the nefarious things that have been happening in the state and, and doesn't happen uh, from anecdotally does not happen as much throughout the state and maybe maybe more in uh, in in South Florida, but uh, election fraud, just repeatedly failing to give documents. 
um, kickbacks, all those sorts of things. Uh, law enforcement needs to know that they have a clean, clear lane to step in when that happens, because otherwise the law enforcement says it's a condo issue, condo says it's law enforcement, and nobody, so we're going to give law enforcement a clear place to step in uh, and address uh, some of these bad actors that um, make life very difficult for people uh, to take care of their property. Do you see anything with any possibly low interest loans for structural repairs? Not a ballot bailout, but maybe some method of funding. Is that possible at all? There is so, nothing in the bill that would oh, right. sorry, Senator Pizzo. The state from a state legislative perspective, there's nothing that, that that comes by way of a financial instrument. However, there are clear access to, to be able to, as Senator Bradley mentioned, this fantastic idea. There was something similar a few years ago. Uh, we're, we're joking, Tara, because some of the components are things that I filed in years past and they fell on deaf ears for some reason. Um, but I'm, I get 5.3% right now in my savings account at my bank. Uh, and we think, what Senator Bradley's point is, we think the building should be able to uh, put forward conservative investments, especially for stuff on the reserves, to be clear that that they're able to do that, set the groundwork for it. I filed that bill a few years ago, a couple times, a couple years in a row, and people freaked out about it. But now it's sort of got an appetite. The other thing is, uh, uh, as everyone uses it, whether it's in a campaign pitch or a talking point, they talk about it's always the 80 year old widow uh, who who doesn't have a mortgage but doesn't have income, living on fixed income, Social Security, whatever. Uh, without going the reverse mortgage route, which I'm not a fan of, there are banks that will lend to, to individual unit owners for special assessments based on the equity they have. Um, management companies are, are getting a little smarter and thinking a little more outside the box. The very first condo town hall that Senator Bradley and I did together um, was actually in Surfside, and we had a bank with us. We brought a bank with us to talk about how they're getting, I don't say more creative, but just just more understanding about about lending instruments there there has been uh, a low interest loan program that that does not have the greatest reputation for single family homes in, in some regards um for doing like hardening and all kinds of improvements whatever but it's a possibility you know to, to do that with condos it, it's something the authority can be given but it's not an actual some counties like miami-dade had a small fund for for condos whatever that's not sustainable that's not going to be statewide um, so it's about getting more creative with, with lending instruments or types of loans, uh, tapping into to equity. But then the realization is like, sometimes that eight year old widow has a hundred percent equity in a unit and maybe on a fixed income and all of a sudden gets sticker shock and slapped with an unfair surprise, perhaps of a $15,000 assessment or $25,000 assessment. It may be time to sell. That, that 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 is if they are unwilling to try to tap tap the equity in their unit and they don't have the income to offset rising prices in insurance and this special assessment that's coming, I, I have told people for two years now that they should expect that's the dollar for dollar discount that's going to be attached to their unit when they go to sell. If I'm selling a three hundred thousand dollar unit and in good faith I'm disclosing that a twenty thousand dollar assessment is coming, uh, you can do a dollar for dollar discount. I mean, it's it's a little bit more sophisticated and obviously a lot larger sometimes, but really how many people watching didn't go under contract at a certain amount and then after an inspection seek credit for some sort of repair, whether it was an appliance or a fixture or something, and say, listen, just uh, let's just renegotiate this and, and credit me X number of dollars against what the original offer was. I, I've done it with every place that I bought, uh, with the exception of, of, of the last one. It's always like, well, the anticipation was that this was going to be in good working order. This was going to be sound. This did not have to be replaced. The home inspection came back and said, this is awful. This HVAC problem, this problem, this problem. And then you've asked for a credit at closing. And I think it's going to be somewhat really just similarly situated with that idea. That's going to be, you should expect that. It has never been the case, but I think in some regards, do I think there are developers who are salivating over the idea that you can plant the seed that something's wrong with the building, it's going to be really expensive, and then there's going to be a bunch of fire sales and duress for a number of units to get them up. Yes, yeah, I think that I think it's happening. I think it's happened before. I think it will continue to happen. But I have some buildings in my district who have done things the right way from the get-go and have been absolutely – I have some buildings in Aventura and Sunny Isles 
they've done what they were supposed to do. And it's what I told 20 reporters waiting outside the Senate chamber a couple of years ago when Senator Bradley passed her first bill is don't wait on us to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. My first piece of advice was tell your nieces and nephews and kids to become structural engineers because we need them in Florida. But number two, don't wait on us for you guys to do the right thing. There is that my mother and father took cars to be serviced when they should have been serviced, got tires checked when they should have been, changed the oil when they should have been, and didn't treat it like a rental car, right? So there's a there's a maintenance program that 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 takes a little bit more energy and effort, but obviously saves saves whatever in the long run. But from a dollar for dollar basis, I just wanted people to to, to be mindful of this. Up to what limit would you spend to repair your car? Uh, so what limit would you would you pay to repair a phone or some other device? What percentage of its actual value to you and you know its market value? What percentage of your home are you willing to repair it? There's a break point where it's like, no, it's not worth it. And uh, I don't want to be here. This is an albatross. Um, and then one of your uh, viewers actually asked, we're putting all these requirements on, on board members as if it's somewhat onerous. Are we contemplating removing volunteer positions for paid positions? The answer is no. No. The, the answer is no. You are the steward, and and while you have a, a greater responsibility as a, as an association board member, that comes with greater training requirements. Or greater, you're, you're also the steward of of people's largest asset, and that that is a huge responsibility. But selfishly, you, you are, you're also taking care of your own asset because you're an owner, obviously, if you're on the board. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. I mean, that, that's the, the the best way to say. It. But. Um, but but not to replace it, you know, with with other position, not with a with a paid position. And Tara, one of one of the other um, things that we're still negotiating in the bill and still working through is the idea of allowing a line of credit. If an association is going to see an increase in their reserves, that's going to result in a, in in higher monthly assessments, allowing that association to take out a line of credit. They don't have to draw down much like you would have a HELOC on your house. Uh, they can take out a line of credit to, to satisfy those increased reserve requirements for a few years, maybe take it through 29. Um, and that way we know, the state knows, that should that repair need to be made, should the roof collapse, should there be a big electrical issue, they have access to funds. Um, but it also avoids them having to ramp up in cash immediately year one. So it is a glide path of sorts. Um, and the the, specific, the specifics of that, we're still uh, kind of trying to work out. Um, but that's something that I think would be, would, would satisfy the requirement of making sure that there are funds there to keep the building safe, yet not requiring all of it to be in cash year one. Um, and, but that would not be, that is not a long-term solution. Uh, that is something that we'd have to agree on a term of years, maybe uh, 29, where they can continue to ramp up their cash reserves, uh, but still have access to funds should they need it. And we're back to the three pillars, insurance, banking, and politics, right? And I can tell you that many of the bankers that we work with, as well as we're approached by all the time by investors, they like to give loans on condominiums as long as you have your paperwork in order, because they can always pool and have the ability to assess the owners, right? You have that assessment. So as an investor, as a bank, you don't, we don't really, we shouldn't need the state to come in and provide the money, the banks and the, um, there's investors that are really offering money at the same rate that the banks are, are right there saying, Hey, if you have your milestone done, if you have your serves done, if you're ready to go, if you have an RFP, we're willing to lend you the money. So we often get questions about the money when we haven't gotten through steps one, two, or three. Everyone's worried about step four and five before they even start. So again, go out there. You've had since 2022, we're coming into 2024. It's the end of the road. You have to get your structural integrity reserve study done and your milestone done. So let's talk really quickly a little bit about those laws. Um, we didn't want to spend too much time on that because we know you've heard it a lot over the past year. So I get the question all the time and I, I'm so confused. They say I'm down in South Florida. If you are watching and you are in South Florida, the milestone inspection is a lower bar than the recertification. So you are going to be 
governed by your local building official. In Broward, they changed it to 25 years. You have to do a structural and electrical recertification. In Dade, it's 30, but you have to do structural, electrical, thermal, and parking lot illumination. Mm -hmm. So people watching in the panhandle, be happy you're not in Dade, right? You have a little bit of break. You only have to do one instead of four. Um, we had an association just this morning call and they wanted to hire us to do a milestone. And I said, wait a second, didn't you just do a recertification in 2016? They said, yes. I said, well, you still have another two years. So any South Florida, you're going to go by your local jurisdiction. And that's one of the things that Jennifer Bradley added to her last bill is that the local government has the opportunity to shorten or lengthen or see do whatever they say see fit shorten not lengthen not lengthen ever they couldn't lengthen it what about down in um for hurricane ian what about captiva island so senator Bradley, you want to take it they, they, they can they can offer what the default state number is an amount uh, or or go less in the interest of public safety, but Senator yeah, Bell, you so, want to take that? So if if you have if you're required to have a milestone inspection, but you've had a uh, say you've had a recertification three years prior, uh, you are allowed to rely on that recertification. Uh, but your ten years starts from the date of that recertification. It's not ten years from when your milestone is is due. It's not like you have set your your ten years because they need to be done in ten year intervals. So it'll be due from ten years from uh, the date of the milestone upon which you're relying. But also your your bill, which became law, has a default number of years for for milestone inspections, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I am following it. Thirty yeah. it's thirty years. Uh there was an original in 4D. Uh there was a concern over inlet space, Tampa Bay, intercoastal. Should we do 25 years to a shorter timeline in other around other bodies of water? Uh it it just proved to be really cumbersome and difficult to figure out exactly where it applied and does it apply to me? Is it the way a bird flies? I mean, it, it just was it, the distances got to be challenging. 30 years, unless your local jurisdiction says nope. We want it to be uh, less than 30 years. Can't be more, but uh, less than 30 years. Right. So Tara, to, just, just to be clear, so when people are watching about the sort of levels of control or hierarchy, the state the state law now is 30 years unless, again, your county or local uh, government wants to make it shorter for whatever new reasons they're, they're enumerating, but they can't go and say, no, we're not going to use the state's 30. We're going to give everybody 45, to be clear. Yeah. Right. It's 30 unless... The local government Let's, has a shorter span. Yeah. Right. And I get this question a lot because I get a lot from my Broward residents. I have uh, one constituent, Chris Nelson, who might actually be on today. And he's like, whoa, you guys did 30 years. Why is my building telling me I have to do 25? And that's when I explained that Broward actually has a separate uh, schedule. Right. So we have two things we're doing. First is the milestone inspection that see something, say something visual inspection. Then we also have the bill has the structural integrity reserve studies known as SIRS or SEERS, and that is your capital funding plan. So you guys wanted to make sure we don't just wait till it's 30 years old and then all these people now that are baby condominiums run into the same problem as the older condominiums. The legislature wanted to make sure everybody had a funding plan, and that's what the Structural Integrity Reserve Study is. Do you want to talk about the dates associated with that? Yeah, and that's a great um, uh, great point to make. Milestone is 30 years and older. SERS is every condo. If you're three stories or higher, the SERS, the SERS is going to be relevant and important to you. So you, everyone has to have their SERS complete by the end of 2024. Um, I suggest getting them now, understanding what those requirements are going to be. You're going to have to have a SERS by the end of 24. That SERS is going to be the basis of your budget that you adopt in 25. So if you if you get the SERS uh, at the end of 24, when you adopt your budget in 25, say it's in December, November, December of 25, that budget is going to need to have uh, the financial uh, parameters set forth in that SERS. And if you got it in 2023, you're still expected to vote on it in 2025, not 2024. There's been some questions about that. The the law requi only requires that the budget adopted on or after July 31st, 24, which would be a, a budget you adopt in 25, that's when you're legally required to include those search requirements. So I guess I would recommend that that you 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 go ahead and include them 
if you don't, you're you're not in non you're not in non-compliance if you fail to do it until 25. Probably best practice, probably advisable if you want to ramp up, uh, but you're not legally required to do it until your 25 budget. And even if you don't need to do it to 2025, I get a question from a condo. Well, why do we want to do it today? And I give the answer. Okay, if you knew that you were driving to work on January 1st, 2026, and your car was going to break down, would you want to know when it was raining on the side of I-4 stuck there? Or would you want to know a year before so you had a chance to maneuver? You could do maintenance on your car. You could budget for a new car. You could take an Uber that day. You could do a million things. So the transparency, the knowledge to give the board the time, and maybe Sally over in 4D that has to move, it gives the people that maybe have to move the ability to do that and not be the last one sitting there after all the realtors are in arms and everybody's upset. The earlier you do this, and you guys, we're at the last year. I don't know how much we keep saying earlier. It's the end, the better you'll be. Tara, are you, cap just a quick question, just for your viewers. Are you capturing questions posed or comments posed in the chat? Yes. Okay. So the Senator Bradley and I would be very interested to respond to, to a lot of these people individually, yeah. just, you know, out of, out of a time constraint. Some people are saying some excellent things, asking some questions, which yeah. we'll, 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 we'll follow up with some easy clarifications. Uh, and then we can also do for people's sort of self-serving fashion for them, a summary of, of, yeah. of some of these issues as well. And I, I just saw a question came through and said, wait, you said the 25 budget. I thought it was the 26 budget. And and what what we're saying is it's there's the year you vote on the budget. So if you vote on your budget, which will have these search requirements, if you vote and adopt the budget at the end of 25, that is likely what you're calling your association's 26 budget, because that will mm -hmm. be in place for the next 12 months. So the 26 budget will have the search requirement voted on at the end of 25. And that really the people that have to be the most aware are the people that have their budget that start in the middle of the year. Right. Because remember, if you have to fund by January 1st, 2026, that means you're going to have to vote sooner because you're going to have to start the middle of 25. So when you get halfway through your budget in 2026, that you're in compliance. And so last year's bill, Senator Bradley, did it have different dates that some people might still be remembering? Uh, yeah, 154, we had, we changed that language for if your budget was adopted, uh, you have your, sir, it used to be the SERS in 24 and the budget in 24. And we changed that to really e extend for a year. So, and, and for the other practical reason that it's hard to have your SERS due at the end of 24 and the budget also all be included in that at the, in the same time frame. So we, 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 we made it a sequence. We have SERS first in 24. Then when you vote on the budget in 25, sure. which was probably your 26 Wait. budget, uh, sure. it, that's included. And there's a couple other comments that follow, and we're happy to follow up with people. Some have people have a yeah. fiscal year that's different and uh, and some caveats that people were asking about, but we're happy to answer those. Yeah. So the structural integrity reserve study, these are for eight items. That doesn't mean that it's just eight items. It could be more than eight items because one of the items says if it's anything over $10,000 that affects the structural integrity of the building. It doesn't mean every item over $10,000, just something that could be affecting. So we give the example a lot is the pool. If your pool is in the middle of the parking lot, then that's not a structural item. But if your pool is on your rooftop and the coating is leaking and going into the building, one of the many problems at Surfside, right? That becomes a part of the structural integrity. So that's where working with your structural integrity reserve professionals will help you navigate. The have to, you're required to fund for the structural integrity reserve items. And then we had some changes as well as it is for regular reserves for all condominiums, regardless of height. Did you guys want to take this? That's right. If if you are not subject to the search requirements, meaning if you are in a condo that is one or two stories, uh, if you fall in that exception of one family, two family, three family dwellings, uh, that don't exceed three three stories above ground. There's a, there's a few uh, small exceptions there. Uh, you are able to to still waive your reserves, but you have to waive with a majority vote of all the owners. 
not a majority of quorum, which used to be the case prior to, to 4D and 154. It requires a majority vote of all of the owners in the association. And guys, this is just all of your dates here. So we have milestone inspections, three stories or more, 30 years and older, completed by December 31st and then every 10 years. Recertification counties, you're not going to do the milestone, you're going to do the recertification. SIRS, just like she talked about, completed by December 31st, 2024, voted on into 2025, fully funded. What does fully funded mean? Jennifer Bradley talked about that already. It means any, if you're looking at the graph, any time in the future when your engineer of record says that that roof has to be replaced, you have the money on that day to replace the roof. That doesn't mean you have all the money for the roof on January 1st, 2026. It means looking at that graph, nothing ever goes below zero. And that was a big point of confusion last year as well. Yeah. Your traditional reserve study, that is typically based on your community documents. Currently, there's no law that requires a traditional reserve study at any time. They're recommended by our firm every three to five years. Um, you can do them as the board or you can hire a professional company to do that. What's on the traditional reserve study? That's everything else, everything that you put on there before, your elevators, your pavement, your lights, your chimney caps, things that aren't making sure that the building stand up, it's still very important to the functioning of the, of the building. Your valuation appraisal, that's still required every three years. Why is it required every three years? Because insurance companies, one of the pillars of society, wants to make sure they're collecting enough premiums. So they made it law or lobbied to do law that says every three years you must go and get a valuation so they're collecting the correct amount. We may be looking at that. If I can get Senator Bradley on board, I, I've met her once, I think. We are seeing situations where buildings are going and getting their appraisals. The insurance companies that they're going with are not lending much credence to those appraisals and doing their own or, or putting in a separate valuation. So if a lot of my buildings in my district, if they're paying thousands of dollars for these appraisals, but they're not applicable and usable, and they're not being honored and accepted at face value for, from the insurance company, that's something we might have to look at. And a, and a corollary to that is we're seeing uh, associations get their serves done. They have the uh, inspection done. They come out, they say, okay, you have 10 years of remaining useful life. The reserve study sets out 10 years. Then they go to get insurance and the insurance company says, now you got to replace your roof. At, uh, your, your roof is seven years old and, and it needs to be replaced. And there isn't, uh, so we're requiring them to do these state studies and insurance companies uh, have their own rules and trying to sort out uh, when does that roof need to be replaced? And 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 it's um, you know it's there's it's just not you know there, we continue to see some of those hiccups. There there are hiccups, but if you're working with a reserve company, I know we take those we take insurance into consideration with our background and so much like we know what things cost to rebuild. We've been involved with claims with almost a billion dollars right now. We also take into account that we live in the state of Florida, all right? Just because the manufacturer says 30 years on roofing, there is no roof that lasts 30 years in Florida. The new insurance policies say that at 15 years, you're basically getting an ACV policy or need to have or actual cash value policy or need to have someone else come out and look at the roof. Those things need to be taken into account for your reserve study to make sure that they're accurate. The a reserve study is a look at the next 25, 30 years in which not one thing's gonna happen exactly as planned in the next 30 years, but it should be a very good guideline on, on a financial path on how to get there. And the, and the Tara, bottom, yes. Tara, the, the other issue is we, we know that in addition to all the reserves, everything we've just talked about, and we, we're talking about it now with insurance, um, it, the rates are, are very high. We understand that condo owners are dealing with these reserves at the same time uh, that insurance rates are very high. So in addition, over the last summer of going through and, and putting together sort of the comprehensive package that we'll see this session, uh, the other thing that uh, Senator Pizzo and myself and others have worked on is what targeted things, what targeted measures can we take with regard to insurance for condos in the state of Florida? just targeted to condos only uh, that will help move the needle a little bit. I mean, it's not going to 
create a 30% reduction in rates, but what can we do to provide some relief? And you will see uh, probably three or four bills filed this session in that regard to try to uh, mitigate some of those risks, whether it be expanding My Safe Florida uh, home hardening program that's available now for single family, just expanded to townhomes, allow condo owners to do that, have that matching grant program so they can harden and then hopefully see that uh, reduction when they go to renew. Um, allow condos to do an actual cash value policy on the roof. We are requiring them to fully reserve replacement for that roof. So if they have the actual cash value coverage, they've got the money in reserve to be able to uh, be made whole. So and and also expanding some wind only coverage for condos. So there's a lot of condos that are outside what what citizens, the citizens wind pool now. Um, those pools are are very old. They haven't been updated in a very long time. Um, and so trying to have some more window leads. So there are targeted bills coming just so that you know uh, with regard to condo insurance this session. And I can tell you because I've been in the insurance world for, since 1999, and that's my arena. And just like there's things that are cyclical with the housing market, there's things that are cyclical with insurance. So I can tell you, and I'm certainly a professional, I don't know if you would say I'm a, the expert in this, but I've seen it happen before. The bottom line is that rates in Florida were artificially low. People for condominiums were paying the same thing in Florida as they were in Arizona in the middle of the desert. So now we're saying, everyone's like, oh my gosh, our insurance is so expensive. It's the market. It's that private mar market dictating itself. So we had 10 years with no storms. What happens? Competition. You know, they're all making money. As long as insurance companies are making money, life is good. And it drove down deductibles. So now we had 1% deductibles. We had high wind driven rain limits. We had everything under the sun because there was competition. And then after Irma, we talked about that hardening of a market. Now we're artificially high. But I do believe as an insurance professional that it, the market will self-regulate because what happens now is insurance companies got everything they wanted last session. The laws are in their favor. They don't have problems with attorneys. We have deductibles that are sky high. We have ACV coming on roofs. We have wind-driven rain that are so low, mold that's so low. They are going to make money in these upcoming years. So once insurance companies start making money again, then other insurance companies want to make money. Then they come back into the state. Then all of a sudden the market will go down. So while you have the responsibility as our representatives to do your best, I can tell you the market will regulate, but we have to get through these next couple years. And it sucks that it's the same time as the SERS and everything else, but that's sometimes the way life happens. But I do believe that rates will, after this next year, they'll stabilize and then continue just to go down because we're already seeing new people coming into the condominium space. These reports are going to help. If you were an insurance company, wouldn't you feel a lot more comfortable insuring a risk if you knew what was underneath the hood? Now that they're able to look at these milestone reports and they're able to look at the reserve, it's going to make it much more attractive for an insurance company to take on that risk. So everything's happening at the right time. And that new world of condo living, lower insurance premiums will be part of that as well. That's my prediction. Well, again, to your point, it is the perfect term. It's actually a triumvirate of, of, of awfulness. It's not just increased insurance rates, but these requirements that we have to put in. It's also if you're going to refi right now at higher uh, high mortgage rates than than he, than he would have had before. So even those that are looking to tap into the equity are obviously yeah. gonna, gonna cry foul. So before we adjourn, this is my pitch on what we're doing. We appreciate you being hosted by Stone Building Solutions. Again, don't make five calls, make one, um, one inspection, five reports for guaranteed savings. You can find us at stoneBLDG.com. You can log on and ask for a proposal and we'll send it. And we so appreciate everyone's time on the panel today. I can tell you, everybody watching, keep an eye out for um, Senator Jason Pizzo. I think there's very big things ahead for him in the state. Um, and I've become a fan, even being a loyal Republican like I am. So what do you can say? I, I really appreciate everything that you're doing for condominium Please customers. send us all of the stuff that you captured because we do want to, there's a bunch of things I want to reply to individually that, that you guys have on there. 
We'll send yeah. it to you all and everybody that watched, this will be available on our YouTube channel starting tomorrow. Excellent. Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Karen. Have a great Thanks, day. Everybody. Thanks.